What a pleasure it is to interview and get to know Lisa Marie Redfern, author of the Haley E. Trilogy, culminating in her most recent book, Haley and the Traveler's Stone. Now, not only is she a wonderful writer, but her talent doesn't stop there. As an accomplished artist, photographer, graphic designer, and businesswoman, Lisa stretches the boundaries of her art, using her way with words and imagery, enticing followers to dip their toes into the rippling waters of imagination. In addition to being an author, Lisa, you're also an artist and photographer with a busy home life. How do you find time to write? Yeah, organization is a must. I use a Google Calendar, and I have that synced to my smartphone so that I can check my calendar whether I'm out and about or on my computer at home. I also have a son who's in school and so I try to get as much done as I possibly can while he is at his work. And then I work best in the late part of the day. And so when the family's all in bed and the phone has stopped ringing, that's when I go to town and I try to just, you know, really focus in and, and get as much stuff done. I try to stop before it gets too late. Lisa, you're incredibly multi-talented and your website and book trailer are amazing. What advice would you give to new writers and artists regarding the social media or networking platform? As far as social platforms go, I'd say if you're just starting out, you want to just realize that it takes time. You're not going to have a thousand followers overnight. You're going to start with five and then go up to 25 and then just keep going. So you want to pick the areas that you feel comfortable in first. Um, the first two ones that I started with were Facebook because I already had a Facebook account and then I did Google Plus and the reason I did that is because I researched um, searching and Facebook has a closed system so if you just do like a general search on the web you're not going to the stuff that's on Facebook is going to come up on the search. So if you put things in Google, um, you will come up on the search. You know, wait till you feel like you you understand how that one works before you go on to the next one. There have been a lot of times when I've joined in and I didn't really understand the, um, the rules of the group and so I would put something on there and then a moderator would go, eh. So you really kind of have to understand, you know, how it works because everyone's a little bit different. Being a photographer, I'm really visual and so, and I liked organizing data. So it was just like easy for me just to look at all these gorgeous pictures and, and organize which boards to put them on. And so just, you know, unfortunately with that one, two hours have gone by because it's just really fun and kind of addicting. But what I finally started to realize was there is a neat thing to do with organizing some data. What I did on Pinterest is I started a collection of public domain images. I'm really a supporter of using images properly. And so a public domain image is something that it's okay to use both for personal use and public use. It's not required that you give attribution to the author, but I always like to whenever I can because I feel like that's the polite thing to do. And so at this point right now, I've got about 3,000 images that I have found all over the place. So if you need an image for your blog or even a book jacket, you can check there. There might be a good resource there for you. Have your characters ever done anything that surprised you? And if so, what happened with that? Yeah, my characters surprise me all the time. I feel like it's really that voice of creativity that's talking through those guys. So the way I work is, when I start a book, I have a long piece of craft paper that I spread out on a big long table. And I put my main characters on the top, and then I put like key events of what's gonna happen in the story. And then I have a notebook that I carry around with me, and every time I'm like waiting for anything, any downtime, I'm writing in the notebook, and I'm filling in those sections of the story. So then when I've got like a bunch of stuff in the notebook, I sit down and I start to type. And usually it's that time when the characters, no, we're going to do it this way, or I'm going to say this instead. And I kind of have to just go, hmm, okay. And so we have like this mental conversation back and forth between us. And, and um, most of the time they're right, uh, but we have to like argue about it for a little bit first. Tell us a little about your female protagonist and the passions that drive her thoughts and actions. Um, Haley is a young woman. We pick her up her story up when she's in high school and having some of those painful high school moments that we all remember not so fondly. Um, 
She lives with a wounded parent. Her um, mom died when she was really young, and that was a very strong love for her dad. And so he's never really come back from that. He's poured himself into his work, and he's pretty much shut everything else out. And so Haley is taking on a lot of responsibilities that kids her age might not do. She does a lot of um, taking care of the house and their meals and their animals, and she tries to stay out of her dad's way because she feels like that's the best thing she can do for her dad. And the fact that she's lost a parent so young in life, it kind of makes her odd at school. Um, the people around her don't really know how to relate, and she doesn't know how to relate to them either. And then combining that with she's very smart, so she's just kind of on the edge, on the outside edge. She really wants to be part, but um, it's just not working. So by the time she turns 18, um, something happens to her, something pretty drastic. And at first, it looks like it's kind of a cool thing because instead of being very mousy, she's now all of a sudden very beautiful. And that beauty, that outward beauty, is what draws in a lot of attention. And at first she thinks, oh, that's pretty cool. And then as things go progress in the story, it starts to have a darker element to it. And um, she's trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And then eventually it gets to the point where the people she cares about the most are in danger from her. And so she was trying to carry on with her life and go forward with the plan. And then all of a sudden she can't do that anymore. She's got to drop everything and try to figure out um, how to stop what's going on and then how to fix it. Um, so throughout the story, we see the young girl maturing into a woman. We see her self-direction um, evolving and she's got a belief that if she faces her problems head on, then something good can happen after that. In Haley and the Traveler's Stone, Haley is transported to the turbulent backdrop of the San Francisco Gold Rush in 1849. During this time in California history, the population was dominated by young male adventurers who came from all over the world. Why did this specific era personally resonate with you? I was attracted to the California Gold Rush because where I live, I'm, I live right in the heart of the gold country. Um, the California Gold Rush is such a part of our history, it's just in everything. And it's, it's the adventurers coming from all over the world to you know, make a better life. I wanted to explore the gold rush in more detail. I wanted to get a sense of what it was really like to you know, wear the clothes, smell the smells, walk the walk, talk the talk. Um, so a lot of research went into finding all these things out. Um, I focused on San Francisco because that was the birth of that city really is when the gold rush happened. There were um, shipping companies all over the world, you know, advertising for people to come, you know, go, go on, take their ship and, and go to San Francisco and, and go find your pile. So I found a lot of really fun things about San Francisco that I, even I didn't know. I think I might have to come up with some kind of quirky little travel thing. But the Maritime Museum, just a very rich source of information, San Francisco History Museum. One of the things that was really neat was the mud. The mud was just everywhere. Big gaping holes. It, the way I read the accounts of people that had to deal with the mud, it was it's like, almost like quicksand. So things were just like, going in the mud all the time. They were putting brush and sand and everything in. And at one point there was a thing where they were just throwing household things in there. And to get from point A to point B, you'd kind of like hop on these things. And, and there was one um, story that I found that was like a big like stove that you'd cook on in your kitchen that was in the mud and it was so far down that there was a very little bit left. And so I wove that into Haley's story and um, you can get a kick out of it now that you know that it really was a real thing. Now, you're obviously drawn to the metaphysical and otherworldly in many aspects of your creativity and writing, sometimes blurring the lines between the real and the fantastical. What is it that draws you in or inspires you? My art and my writing do have a lot of like mysticism kind of qualities. Um, and I think where that comes from for me is that I have um, a very deep hope and a faith that we are much more than just our bodies. Um, I think that all life um, should be respected and honored and that we need to just really be conscious of the great gift that it is while we're here. Um, 
and I think that the real magic in this world is love and the relationships that we have with the people around us and our animals and all living things on this planet. Thanks for watching. If you're looking at this on anything other than YouTube, don't forget to check the little box right there to go to YouTube. There you'll find links that I've left you that go over all the topics that we've covered, plus a few more. Happy authoring, happy marketing, most of all, happy reading. I read Debbie McClure's paranormal romance books, In the Spirit of Love and In the Spirit of Forgiveness. The first book swept me away into the story of a ghost who needed help to solve a mystery. Debbie's characters are entertaining and she's a great relationship writer. The first book immediately led into the second. Fun, fun, fun reading. My only complaint was I wish there was a third book in the series. Thanks, Debbie. I've never met a ghost, so I don't know if they exist. But for the sake of my book, I had to treat my character and give him characteristics that are very human. Christina Hamlet is the hub of the author network and the owner of the blog, You Read It Here First. Christina is at the top of her game. She's written over 30 books. She's also a screenwriter and you can't help learning from her no matter what she puts out. I had the opportunity to read her book, Screenwriting for Teens. I would say this is not a book for teens only. It's for anyone who wants to improve their storytelling skills, whether it be in writing or on a video like this. I bought several copies of this book to give to media teachers where my son goes to school. Thank you so much, Christina, for having me on your blog as an interviewee. It was a real pleasure to cross your path and to learn from you.